All right, welcome everyone. We are really delighted uh, to welcome you to our symposium on artificial intelligence and in healthcare, mitigating disparities, biases, and misinformation. My name is Eric Kalachik. I'm going to take you through the first few minutes here and then uh, turn over to the folks who did all the heavy lifting on this. So do people see my slides advance? Yes. Yes. Okay. Always, always. And this Zoom era, always a good thing to check. All right. So a quick word about who we are, since I know we have folks all over the world joining us here uh, at BU's Harari Institute. Uh, Harari Institute is dedicated to leading integrated initiatives in research and technology development, targeting a broad set of disciplines at the nexus of computational and data sciences. We've got core strengths in cloud computing, security, data, privacy, and artificial intelligence as well as a network of over 300 researchers affiliated across a vast spectrum of disciplines. Uh, with all of this, the Hurry Institute is positively impacting people everywhere through our research. Today's program is a culmination of a year-long focused research program at the Hurry Institute. The focus research programs are mechanisms that use to uh, evolve and advance Boston University's research in computing and data science around particularly areas of strategic importance and emerging opportunity. These programs are designed to facilitate research convergence by providing a type of scaffolding for groups to coalesce in sustainable ways, all with the goal of accelerating research for broader impact. So I have a number of people to thank here. Uh, I wanna first of all, thank the co-sponsors. So besides the Hurry Institute, this is co-sponsored by the BU Center for Information and Systems Engineering, the BU College of Communications Division of Emerging Media Studies, right? And the BU School of Public Health. And I'd like to introduce to you uh, today our focus research program leaders and today's hosts. So we have Yanis Pashalides, who is a professor of electrical computer systems and biomedical engineering here at BU, as well as professor in the computing and data sciences faculty. He's the director of the Center for Information and Systems Engineering and his research interests include data science and AI with applications in computational biology and medicine. And then with him is Gianluca Stringini, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering here at Boston University. He co-directs the security lab or the SECLA BU and his research interests span computer security, data science, and computational social science. So I am extraordinarily grateful to the both of them for all the work and leadership they've done this past year with an amazing team of faculty and students and postdocs from across the university. And I'm particularly appreciative for the work they did in helping pull together today's session. So Giannis, I'm gonna turn it over to you, I think. Yes. Thank you, Eric, uh, and uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome everyone today to this symposium, and I would like to thank uh, Eric Kolachik and the Hariri Institute for supporting this symposium and also for supporting our focused research program. So this is something that we've been working for about a year now, and uh, our objective was not only to discover how biases affect health and healthcare, I have big news for you, they do, but also to explore how AI techniques and more generally algorithmic methods can help mitigate uh, these biases and, uh, and these effects. So next slide, please. So as Eric mentioned, uh, this is a really large team of uh, faculty with many graduate students working on these types of problems. And in this slide, you can see uh, these faculty that have been involved in this effort. And also you can see the diversity of the different units at Boston University where these faculty are coming from, uh, including the College of Engineering, the College of Arts and Sciences, uh, specifically computer science, uh, the College of Communications and the uh, Department of Emerging uh, Media Studies as well the School of Medicine and uh, the School of Public Health. So next slide, please. In terms of the specific areas where our work has focused, we looked uh, uh, essentially at two broad themes. So one was the role of social determinants of health. 
uh, and how these affect and variety of different conditions. So we looked at uh, the role of social determinants of health uh, in missed medical appointments. We focused on imaging appointments and then on some of the fairly common chronic diseases. So we looked at hypertension and how social determinants of health uh, are involved in uh, patients that have poorly controlled hypertension. Uh, and also we looked at, uh, at COVID in uh, collaborating with the Boston Medical Center where some of our data are coming from. We looked at uh, COVID outcomes, so predicting uh, hospitalizations, even predicting the, the path of a patient during a hospitalization, whether the patient would need ICU treatment or not, whether they would need a ventilator or not, and uh, whether there are biases and also whether there are social determinants of health that are important in making these types of predictions. Uh, and finally, we looked at uh, tracking health misinformation on social media. We have seen during the pandemic that uh, social media play an important role in shaping public opinion. Uh, my co-conspirator in this effort, uh, Gianluca Stringini, who is a, a professor in electrical and computer engineering, has been responsible for, for this track. And I think this is a, a point where I'm handing over to Gianluca for presenting to you the agenda for today's event. Uh, all right. Thanks, Yanis. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, next slide. Thanks. Uh, so yeah, today we have a full day of uh, uh, talks, panels, and discussion. So we'll start with uh, a panel where we are uh, uh, basically setting the agenda for the day. The goal of the panel will be to identify the challenges, risks, and opportunities of AI and healthcare. Uh, and then we'll move to the first of three sessions. We'll look at AI in healthcare, algorithmic and data bias, and mitigation strategies. Uh, we'll have a lunch break. Uh, during the lunch break, we'll have a poster session. I'll tell you more about the poster session in, in a moment. Uh, and then we'll move to our second session where we'll be looking at learning health systems that leverage AI. Uh, then we'll have a short break. And then we'll have the last session, which will be about uh, misinformation and health uh, with a specific focus on COVID-19, given uh, you know, that it's been one of the main topics uh, that we had to deal with in the last uh, two years. Uh, and then we'll finally close. <laughs> um, so during the poster session, we'll move to a different platform. We do this on Gather Town, which is this 2D virtual world, kind of like a video game. You can walk around and talk to people um, that's supposed to simulate you know, the real conference experience. Uh, so we'll ask you to log out of Zoom, uh, join Gather Town. Uh, you should have received the link for that. Uh, please use uh, Chrome or Firefox for that. Um, and then what you can do, you can set your own avatar so you can choose how you look in the in this virtual world. And then you can turn on your uh, mic and video. And the idea is that as you move closer to somebody, uh, both mics and videos will turn on and you can talk to each other. Um, if you have any issues, you can uh, refresh your browser or uh, um, you know review the bulletins, but we have instructions in the poster uh, session space that will, uh, will help you with that. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so this is what uh, Gather Town looks like. So we have posters set up. And if you walk close to the poster, uh, pressing X, you can view the poster and you can talk to the presenter. Uh, you can use the arrows to, to navigate. Uh, if you don't have arrows, you can use the ASDW um, uh, keys, like a old school gamer <laughs> or, or whatever. Um, yeah, next slide. And yeah, we have 10 presenters presenting uh, across a variety of spectrums of, of topics that cover everything that we'll be discussing in, uh, um, in, this, uh, in this symposium. So please go and check out their posters uh, during the lunch break. Uh, next. Okay, uh, then I'm uh, giving the podium back to Eric, who's going to introduce our first panel. Okay, fantastic. Thank you both. All right, so we're going to move then to the panel portion to uh, to open today's uh, symposium. 
Uh, the panel is going to focus on challenges, risks, and opportunities of AI in healthcare. We specifically put this panel at the beginning uh, to try and set as broad a stage as possible for the sessions that we have later to try and stimulate discussion and ideas that might in turn then nudge uh, some of the speakers in their own talks to begin weaving themes together. And I think some of the closing marks will also uh, try and do that. Um, thanks again to Yanis and Gianluca for their help in pulling together this session. And then let me briefly start by introducing the panelists. So we have uh, Dr. Sandro Galea, who is the Dean and Robert A. Knox Professor of the BU School of Public Health. We have Dr. David Bates, who is the Chief of the Division of General Internal Medicine at Brigham Women's Hospital. He's also Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School and Professor of Health Policy and Management at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. We have John Bryden, who is Executive Director and Senior Research Scientist at the Observatory and Social Media at Indiana University. And we have Derry Wajaya, who is Assistant Professor of Computer Science at Boston University. So you can see we've, uh, we've invited a, a group of panelists here, uh, bringing a similarly broad perspective and backgrounds, we hope, uh, to uh, the treatment that we're hoping to give the, uh, the topic today. A couple quick housekeeping items before we get going. Uh, I wanna remind folks that today's session is being recorded uh, and it will be posted to the Hurry Institute's YouTube channel this week. Uh, we also encourage the audience to participate and ask questions. However, we have turned the chat function off, so you'll want to do that through the Q&A. Uh, we have a handful of questions that will begin our panel discussion, and I'll be keeping an eye on the Q&A during the panel discussion uh, that will either in, uh, inform some of the uh, questions toward the end of the panel, or they may be things that we try and work into the program later throughout the day if we don't have the time to use them. All right, so with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and we'll move to our uh, panel. Uh, so again, Sandro, David, John, Derry, welcome all of you. And uh, what I'm gonna do is start by setting the stage a little bit here and then uh, begin with sort of a broad initial question, right? To start staking out uh, initially, what I wanna do is stake out a little sense of what we mean by AI, just because AI seems to mean so many things these days. Um, so we're going to uh, mimic what NSF has used, for example, in defining its, uh, its NSF uh, uh, AI institutes. Uh, to mean that uh, we're looking at not just machine learning, but uh, and its related aspects of data science, uh, not just the things that support tasks traditionally in the domain, say, of human cognition and decision making. So we're thinking, of course, identification, classification, estimation, recognition, prediction, but we're also thinking of related elements required uh, related to AI systems. Uh, ranging from software and hardware architectures to privacy, security, ethics, human emotion, perception, policy. Um, so, so we're picturing really AI and sort of the, 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 the spectrum that's surrounding it as well. So with all of that as context, um, let me throw out a first question for you all. And uh, I'm thinking we can just sort of uh, bounce this around ourselves. If there's sort of some uh, dialogue continuing amongst you all, feel free. And at some point I may say, okay, let's move and I'll, I'll shift us to another question, but please feel free to sort of uh, uh, address them uh, as if we're all just sitting around a table together. All right, so here's the first question. What are the greatest opportunities, thinking broadly and ambitiously, that you see for AI to positively impact human health in say the next decade? And what are in turn the greatest challenges that you think we need to overcome, whether technical, legal, political, social, to capitalize on these opportunities? So who wants to jump in first? <laughs> Well, let me let me uh, jump in now, Eric, if uh, if I may. Thank you. I was afraid I had you all speechless. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, you, well, well, well. A question like that is uh, so. So, what are we going to do? You know, 
tomorrow when we finish answering that question. Um, um, so uh, I'll start with the, let me start with the positives and then I'll move on to the challenges. The, um, I think insofar as AI is a tool in our arsenal, it's a, it's a positive. I think it is a positive and um, we, our health as a world is much, much better than it was 100 years ago than it was 200 years ago, in no small part because of technological advances. Now, I think we need to be careful about the word technological advances because the primary reason why our health is better than it was 200 years ago is the technological advance of soap. And uh, that is uh, far less far less compelling than uh, the words artificial intelligence uh, you know, conjure. So I do think we need to be have the relevant humility to recognize that um, when we talk about technological advances, they can go from uh, not particularly sophisticated to the very sophisticated worlds you're talking about here, which most, most of us only understand the sort of small corners of. But I, I think from a positive point of view, we should be, we should lean into the potential for technology to create opportunities to improve health. So that's statement A. Now let's move on to the challenges for a second. You, you mentioned legal, political, legal, political, technological, legal, political, social. Those are the four you mentioned. So let's talk about each of them. Let's start with technological for a second. Uh, I, I have no doubt that AI is going to help us deliver better healthcare and to some extent deliver better care. Um, I also have little doubt, although I, I say this to be provocative and then maybe some of you will disagree with me, that we are overestimating the time frame in which that will actually happen. I thought the um, Wall Street Journal's uh, analysis of Facebook's use of AI algorithms to weed out hate speech that was featured today was a nice example of that. You can actually see the, the war within, within Facebook. You can see the engineers saying, AI, good, we're going to catch hate crimes. And you can see um, those who are not thinking deeply enough saying, yes, that's the solution, until you actually realize it only catches a tiny, tiny fraction because of difficulties in actually implementing technologically. So I think there is a real technological limit to what we can do. And you know, just moving aside from that, if everybody here will remember, at the beginning of the COVID pandemic, there was a glut of conversation and articles written about how we are all going to use apps to detect whether we come in contact with each other. None of that came to, came to being. Now, that's not because th th that technology wasn't there, but it was because we couldn't figure out a way how to make it work in a short period of time. So I actually do think we're a long way away from the promise of some of these solutions. Now, it's possible that we'll have a phase shift of discontinuity, but, I, but evidence suggests that we're a long way. That's the technical side. Now we get into the legal side. The, the, the paradox is that the better AI approaches get, the more legal and social problems they raise. And uh, that uh, frankly, right now, I'm not particularly worried about facial recognition of me everywhere and me losing privacy. You know why? Because actually I don't think it's that good right now. But once I become convinced that it's actually that good, then I'm actually going to start worrying about it. And then I'm going to look for legal and social and political protections. So we have this, um, right now we're, we're, we're a little bit of an opportunity of a green, a, a green field for AI development, but I think that green field is being afforded to AI development from a legal and social point of view, just because we don't really pay that much attention to it because it's still not that good. So I do think that as these approaches get better, we are gonna see a lot more legal and social problems. And then I'll end with political. I think the, um, the political questions that center around the potential of technologies like this are only we're only just beginning to scratch the surface. And the, you've seen a little bit of it in the context of uh, algorithms used by, obviously by large data companies. And, uh, and my sense is that a lot of these battles are going to be fought in the next 10 years. And uh, I think that pertains equally well to health and healthcare, that uh, the, the things that we talk about in the academy, I think sometimes we forget in the academy, we're actually quite a bit ahead of where society is. So we're beginning to talk about these right now, which means society is gonna be bringing up the rear in the next 10 years. And uh, the implications, for example, just to focus on healthcare, of algorithms that are parametrized on populations as they pertain then to minoritized groups where the algorithms don't actually apply to them, these are huge implications. And I think they are, they will become political issues. They're not just technological issues, they'll become political issues, all of which we'll have to deal with. So to summarize, I think this is good. This is interesting. This has potential. I think we should lean into it. We should be having these conversations. And the mountain of challenges to my mind are really large that we'll have to overcome before this becomes a truly, a, a real, makes a real contribution to healthcare and health. Great. So maybe I'll go next if that's okay. Um, um, I'm gonna just 
it come at it from a different angle. Uh, I'm I'm a doctor in a in a big healthcare system, and I'm just going to share with you a, a list of things that we came up with a, a few years ago. And here our the our outcome was uh, was not human health. It was what can we do to reduce costs? But I think the two are are uh, closely related. Um, and the first thing on the list was was high cost patients. Just a small fraction of patients account for a very large proportion of costs. And if we could figure out in those patients what things they really need to uh, to you know reduce their costs, often it's housing or access to food. Uh, you know that would be really helpful. A second was uh, readmissions. A third one was triage decisions: where to put someone in an, in a hospital when they uh, when they get sick. The third one was a detection of decompensation. Right now, patients begin to decompensate, and often we don't pick it up until too late. And there are already a number of studies showing that you can improve care uh, in, that, in that setting. Uh, another, which is particularly near and dear to me, is uh, adverse events. Um, I work in patient safety, and there are many adverse events we could predict and prevent if we have had better uh, algorithms. Um, Another one is a treatment of patients with chronic diseases. Uh, they account for a very high proportion of costs, especially in the, uh, in the, in the outpatient setting. Uh, on my ch challenges list, I mean, that, that's a long list, but, but you know, biases in, in these algorithms are certainly you know, very high on the list. If we're gonna do the sorts of things that I talked about, uh, you know, we have to be able to develop uh, algorithms that deal with with uh, subpopulations, as Dr. Galea, you know, discussed, uh, you know, data access is a big problem. Having having accurate data is a big problem, uh, and then and then one of the most difficult things I, I think is just getting uh, getting the people who are the recipients of the suggestions to actually pay attention to them. Because if you can't change what people do based on what the AI is, it does make a difference. Thank you, David. Thank you, David. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll jump in now. Uh, so yeah, I'm coming at this from um, an online misinformation or an online information perspective, uh, and really be interested in how you know, artificial intelligence can have an impact on the sort of conversations that are happening online. Uh, and it's important to realize that um, health information, especially in the COVID epidemic era, is, is very important. Uh, uh, and the, uh, coming back to the sort of Sandra was saying earlier, um, getting good information to people is, uh, making good health decisions is one of the important ways that we can um, improve the health of society in, in quite a large way. Um, and at the same time, there's a lot of health misinformation out there on, online and artificial intelligence is giving us opportunities to address that online misinformation. We're able to detect um, uh, a lot of rumors uh, that are spreading about uh, various different treatments for COVID, for example. But also there's um, a lot of astroturfing that goes on by unhealthy commodity industries and start to detect things like that. Um, and there are things like sort of detecting mental health online uh, and uh, early detection of harmful behaviors. These are some of the things that uh, um, artificial intelligence is, is going to be able to do. But I, th I think um, when you're actually kind of interfacing with online behavior, there are a lot of uh, legal challenges to that. There's privacy concerns. There are, as we were talking about earlier, there are a lot of biases in the way that if an algorithm is set up for a certain particular cultural group, they're not uh, attributable to other cultural groups and uh, maybe missing a lot of nuance in, in cultural differences. Uh, and there are also problems with like um, taking down content when you've, you've got uh, uh, harmful content spreading online, bad health information spreading online and, and how you, the legal challenges, especially with the First Amendment of, of taking those kinds of information down. Yeah, 
I guess uh, following up on the discussion so far, uh, one of the coming from the AI perspective, um, because my focus is in uh, research on AI, particularly uh, relating to text uh, through natural language processing. So one of the things that I've seen that have been applied and represent probably one of the biggest opportunity uh, for AI in healthcare is actually related to access, uh, providing the, the access to medical knowledge that would otherwise be uh, inaccessible. For example, I recently attended just this weekend um, presentation by the Health Ministry of Indonesia. So he came and visited Boston and gave a talk uh, at Harvard University. And he talked about how there is a lack of uh, actually health uh, providers uh, in a lot of countries in the world. So if we are talking about the impact of AI on human health, I think we have to think uh, also like globally as we have seen with the pandemic, right? Like uh, one country overcoming pandemic doesn't mean that the pandemic is over because other countries are still experiencing the pandemic. So we have to work together. And one of the things that struck me was like, uh, he mentioned that the number of doctors per 1000 people in Indonesia is only 0 0.4 uh, compared to like in the US, it's about 2.6. Uh, and in other developing country, which is not developed like US, it's uh, usually one per 1,000 person. So I think this um, kind of problem actually opens up opportunities for AI, especially in telemedicine, which maybe not that uh, much application yet in the US, but in countries like developing countries like Indonesia, the use of AI to actually democratize uh, this knowledge, uh, medical knowledge and excellence could actually help uh, improve the, the treatment and diagnosis, even when uh, there are no specialists, especially which are hard to come by. Uh, so I think that for me is probably one of the biggest opportunities in AI uh, on healthcare. Uh, but the challenges, of course, like everyone has mentioned before, uh, legal challenge. And because especially when we talk about data, there is a lack of data availability and also standard of what data should be like, right? How, how we should like uh, gather the data, how we can access the data in a secure way. So these are big challenges that I think underlying the, the challenge is actually legal and policy, policy change <laughs> in terms of what standards we can have to support data infrastructure, making representative data available for, for uh, training this uh, machine learning and other AI algorithms. And another challenge that I find could be uh, a most recent one, which is a mistrust right, in, in AI technologies, especially what has happened in the past few weeks with how algorithms actually use personal information to uh, do some kind of manipulation, right? So I think uh, mistrust in AI technologies could be one of the, um, the biggest challenge that we have to overcome in order for people to actually start uh, trusting in, the, in AI and the decision that it potentially can, can give. So these are the, the opportunities and challenges. Great, thank you all. Thank you, Derry. Can I um, can I pivot from something you just said, Derry, and ask you all to um, reflect a bit um, uh, in, in, in terms of what you're talking about with access? We step back a bit further and reflect on structural and inequities, uh, and 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 reflect a little on on what's needed. Uh, to try and uh, both engage those perhaps with AI, but also uh, to avoid those, uh, those inequities themselves uh, adversely impacting our, our, our everything from our design to our implementation of AI, perhaps despite uh, best intentions. Well, uh, let me um, offer a couple of thoughts on that. I, I think the key is to make sure that we center that in healthcare, we are interested in 
achieving better health and to narrow health gaps. And I say that because I think we often lose sight of the fact that we actually have those two goals. And being upfront about those two goals will then help organize our thinking about what we are doing in the realm of AI, as well as in the realm of other any other technological ad advance towards what we're doing in health. The challenge with this becomes that sometimes the goal of improving health overall may be at odds with the goal of narrowing health gaps. And uh, we need to be aware of that because uh, it's, it's important to surface it. Otherwise, we're simply run into cul-de-sacs without being thoughtful about it. So I think once one puts it up front and center, then I think one can look to see how the AI developments that are happening keep those dual purposes in mind. And it's not good enough to just focus on one without the other. So if there are machine learning algorithms that are being parametrized in particular populations, one needs to recognize that that can actually result in improvement for one population, not improvement in another, which by definition is going to widen health gaps, which means that we should be asking ourselves at any time, um, are there other populations on which we should be um, uh, parametrizing what we're learning here in, for this particular machine learning algorithm? Uh, so I think it really is about the conversation that uh, we consider to be the frame for what we're doing. And the conversation, sh the frame should be improving health, comma, narrowing health gaps. And we're not willing to sacrifice either of those two axes. I agree with that. I, I, I'm going to be talking later about the digital inequity and, and how big a problem that is. But I think it's an absolutely a, a cru crucial problem. It's quite clear, for example, that if you have access to, to broadband, you get better health care in this country. And that I'm sure that's probably true around the world. And, and access to computing technologies of, well, by patients is, is a, just a, a very big deal. At the same time, as uh, Sandra just described, you know, once we do develop algorithms, we have to make sure that they, that they uh, are uh, just. And there's been a lot of really good work uh, done on that. I point to some of the work that's been done by Ziad Obermeyer and some of the people he's uh, collaborated with. And, uh, and uh, you know, the, many people believe that there are technical approaches that we can use to, to uh, develop algorithms that that uh, are uh, truly fair, but that's going to be absolutely pivotal if, as we uh, as we move forward. Yeah, um, I think this is very interesting. Um, and yeah, I, uh, Sandra and David have talked about making algorithms fairer. Um, one of the things I would like to mention is the idea that maybe some of these structural inequities are coming sort of one step further. <laughs> They're coming from the, the nature of people who work in uh, STEM fields. Um, it's, there's a very high bias towards a certain type of cisgendered white male. Uh, and those people have a certain perspective in the world and the, the sort of topics that they would find interesting and valuable to create algorithms for may not be the most useful topics to study. Um, because of the, so there's a there's a bias to the backgrounds of the people doing the research, uh, and this is kind of uh, classically there's a lot of healthcare uh, work done with like uh, male boldness, which is not really a, ma a major problem in, in world health. Um, so there's there's a, a sort of fundamental problem in the in the sort of people working in in, in STEM fields and their perspectives. Uh, so, uh, as well as that, there, there's probably there's still a, 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 um, uh, a uh, potential here for, for journals um, to think about uh, diversity statements for, for AI algorithms. Um, so, the idea when we've got an AI algorithm is to make a statement about how it was tested, how the data were gathered, and how diversity was uh addressed in the design of the algorithm um, and i think these there's potential here for for standards to be introduced so that these things can be addressed in a in the way research is written up um, as well as that i think uh funding bodies could could take uh more of a lead in in making sure that the types of questions being asked and answered are uh are, are appropriately diverse and not 
specific to a certain small subset of the population. Yeah, I, I agree with John. Um, I think when we want to talk about um, equity and how AI could uh, be uh, just and a fair system that is also ethical in its use, uh, we need to talk about the AI uh, developer themselves, like uh, which means everybody involved in developing the AI system on healthcare, for example, not just the programmer, but also the designer, the user interface, the doctors involved, everybody, uh, they have to be diverse. Uh, and this is one of probably the major challenge uh, in AI itself. Uh, separate from healthcare is the lack of diversity in the uh, in the the people who make the the AI programs itself, um, and so I think one of the way we can improve uh, equity is to have more diverse perspectives, so that when we develop um, programs and systems, it will be something that uh, can address the needs of, of uh, diverse set of people, not just uh, uh, like, for example, just a, a, a proportion of the population. And another thing that is, I think, uh, aside from the AI itself, is the data that we are using to train the AI algorithms. Um, because AI de is dependent very much on the data that is used to train the model. Um, data itself can contain bias. Um, and sometimes it's not uh, because the data is um, not accurate, but often it's because it's not representative. So for example, if we train, uh, for example, like John mentioned, if we train the model uh, on predicting baldness, and because most of the population that are bald are certain population, then if we try to use that model, to predict on someone that is different from the population it is trained with, then uh, it can predict with less accuracy and cause errors and potentially injuries, for example. And another um, difficulties could be that the data itself is representative and accurate, but there is already an underlying bias in the data itself, like a systemic bias and things like that, where, for example, um, for an algorithm to um, do pain management. If, you know, by design, a lot of patients of, uh, with different demographics are assigned different pain management, then, you know, the algorithm itself will continue to uh, use the same uh, systemic bias if there is any in the data in its prediction. So it, it is possible that it continues to exacerbate and even carry this bias in future predictions as well. So I think these are the, yeah, the, the, the challenge in, in data in both the people who are um, developing the, the, the technology. Thank you all. Let me um, see if I can synthesize a couple of the questions in the chat since I think it, uh, it, it nudges us in, a, in another direction that's come up a bit in what you were just talking about, all of you. Um, so we're already beginning to see in trends of e-medicine uh, deployment of, of AI tools. And I think some of the discussions that uh, certainly we're having in academia, as Sandro is saying, but even are beginning to be had more in the public or at the a level of uh, a government is what is the role of policy and governance mechanisms uh, around AI in healthcare. The example in the, uh, the Q&A is uh, IRB models in healthcare have been suggested, for example, as an, uh, a, a promising example of a possible oversight mechanism for AI um, where governance might come into play. On the other hand, in terms of policy, uh, someone suggested in the chat that if you, if you don't have the infrastructure, say in rural, environments, um, then how can you hope to bring to bear the AI that might ride on in internet infrastructure or whatnot? Um, so reflections on uh, how to, to bring uh, policy and governance uh, to bear uh, as AI begins to continue to develop? I'll just make a comment on, on that, um, Eric, if I may. 
I, I think there's no question that one will need policy and governance the more AI features in, um, in our lives, in all aspects of our lives, and particularly in healthcare, as we're talking about here. I think the trick will be to have transparent and accountable governance. And I actually think that's quite difficult to do simply because we're dealing with novel tools that most do not understand. And now I think if one is on the side of the development of technologies, the words that are transparent, accountable governance sound like their efforts to roadblock. And I don't mean it that way at all. I think one way to look at it would be that unless we actually think about that right up front, there will be much bigger roadblocks in terms of um, public non-acceptance or sector non-acceptance if it develops too quickly without um, without clarity about that there is accountability to the general public. So I do think it's something that we need to grapple with. And I think, frankly, universities are the right place to grapple with that, to grapple with what does it mean to have uh, transparency and accountability when you're developing uh, systems, technological systems that really far outstrip the technical capacity that most of the end users or most people within these systems are ever going to get, and which is perfectly fine. We don't actually need to, to do that. But I, I, I would encourage us to think of that as the ethical legal frameworks that will allow transparent and accountable governors to be part of what we are developing right up front to the end of not slowing these things down, but actually to the end of facilitating um, the extent to which we can use them towards improving our lives and in this context, improving healthcare. I agree. I, and I think this is a, something of a burning platform because the policies that we have today, you know, really were not developed uh, to, to deal with, with artificial intelligence and with algorithms that learn. And uh, we, we, need, we need new approaches around this. Um, the FDA plays a very big role in, on algorithms in health. Um, and they've, they've approved, you know, roughly 45 or 50 algorithms at last count. Um, um, but think about it. I mean, there, there are going to be so many of these uh, going, going, uh, going forward. Um, you know, we, we need new approaches for, for dealing with that. And our uh, traditional regulatory approaches don't uh, really deal with, with, uh, with uh, algorithms that, that try to learn and they don't necessarily address fairness. Uh, and, and so, you know, we'll, we'll need new policy uh, approaches to, uh, to try and do that, uh, you know, if we're going to get to the uh, sort of uh, transparent and accountable level that, that uh, Sandra was talking about. Yes, I agree. I think there's a, a, a scope here for looking at the ethics of an algorithm not just in terms of the questions about privacy uh, of the, the data that, that's, that's involved in building the algorithm, but also I think the important thing here is the impact of the algorithm on society. And that's an ethical question which is not really addressed in the way people think about ethics. Uh, and so, I think there's scope here for a movement of, of the way um, IRBs are treating ethics reviews into toward uh, considering the impact of, of an algorithm on, on society. And I think government can play a role in that. Yeah, um, yeah, I agree. I think in terms of policy, it's really important. Actually, it's one of the uh, potential mitigation of the risk. For example, with respect to uh, data, uh, government can actually work to provide infrastructural resources for data. For example, uh, starting from setting the standards for uh, the, the records, the health records that, uh, that are safe and secure and to providing actual incentives uh, support in terms of funding and technical support for high quality data gathering, for example, and uh, effective privacy safeguards for the data set. So um, I think uh, some of the uh, very good initiative already by the government is uh, the uh, in the US is, for example, the All of Us initiative by the uh, NIH um, and uh, where they want to actually collect more diverse data that are representative of 
uh, more populations in the in the US. Um, and I think that's uh, another another way government can support this just by providing these actually standards uh, for the for example, if an AI system makes a, makes an error, who should be liable? Uh, one example is a lot of things in AI is not yet regulated. So the, the self-driving car accident, for example, um, that happens where the, the self-driving car that was in, on a test hit a bicyclist and the bicyclist died. Um, at the end, the, the ones that were found guilty is the the person that is inside the self-driving car uh, because uh, they were not paying attention, uh, but the AI system itself wasn't held liable. So I think there is like all these questions about who should be liable for errors, uh, what standards of electronic health records that we should have that can protect the, the privacy of the data. And then what's the ethical use of AI because we have to put ethics and human rights at the heart of the AI's design, as well as data gathering, deployment, uh, making sure it reflects socioeconomic, um, healthcare diversity, and so on and so forth, um, and transparency. Like everyone mentioned, um, when AI makes decision, it should be uh, it should be able to explain, for example, what is the decision it's making. <laughs> So that's one of, I think, the another challenge in AI, but uh, the government can actually create policy to make sure that is something that is, uh, that the AI system developed for healthcare would be able to, to provide. Okay, so we are just about at time, um, but I'm gonna be uh, wild and dangerous here and, and ask you all to, uh, to give an elevator pitch, right? and just react to the following question. We have so many people who are looking now to get into AI and healthcare. It's an area that needs an enormous amount of contribution globally. Uh, for someone who's taking their first steps and in getting involved in this area, right? 10, 15 seconds, what resource would you point them to and why as why don't you start here? I'd say make sure that uh, whoever you're thinking about working with allows independent evaluation of what they're doing. As an elevator pitch, I would point you to the Indiana University Observatory and Social Media's tools, which we have developed quite a lot of tools for, for uh, to looking at uh, misinformation online. Sandro Derry. Uh, I guess uh, resources, because I think in order, if, if you are interested to develop AI for healthcare, I think the most important part is uh, understanding firstly what AI entails so we can know when it makes a mistake, what is the possible cost for it and how we can mitigate it. So uh, take uh, classes in, in AI and machine learning in statistics. I think these are my... <laughs> Yeah, if you are interested and you want to start, then start with that. Great, Sandra? And maybe if I can just comment, uh, Professor Ujaya's last comment. I, I actually think that uh, the important thing is actually to understand health and healthcare. And uh, I think AI is a, is a means, not an end. I mean, there's obviously an end in, in a particular area of scholarship, but if, in the context of the symposium, which is AI in healthcare, presumably we are actually interested in improving healthcare to improve health. And I think a number of the issues that we've surfaced here are dealt with if the practitioners of the technological development understand the goal, understand the end goal, understand health, health outcomes and health equity gaps. And, um, the, you know, we, we worry a lot about a number of things and I'm looking at the Q&A uh, that's, uh, that's floating by. These are all valid concerns, but I have, I have uh, faith in people of good intentions who are trying to develop these technologies to actually do good things, as long as we make sure that we actually understand what we're trying to do. So I suppose the resources I would want to lean into are the understanding health resources, the resources that allow people to understand health and trying to make sure that those who are responsible for technological development are not working in their own bubbles. Thank which you. is why the symposium is wonderful, which and I'm delighted that we're doing it and thank you for inviting me. All right, thank you all. 
Derry, John, David, Sandro, thank you very much for joining us this morning. I think it's really been a great way to launch uh, what's going to be an exciting day of really interesting talks. I want to thank the audience for their q and I did my best to weave uh, some of what you uh, brought up there into uh, today's panel, and I'm sure that similar types of uh, uh, topics are going to be touched on throughout the day. Uh, I want to remind you as well, the video from this session will be posted to the Hurry Institute's YouTube channel. And I'm going to turn it now over to Yanis Pashalidis to introduce uh, the next symposium.